have the book in my hands in a manner of speaking, but um, it's not quite um, finished. It'll be finished next week, which is ironic. Um, so what I'm going to actually do, uh, this feels like my, my baby in... Talk about metaphors in pieces. So this is ew. So this is um, this is these are the proofs of my book, and I'm going to pass them around just in case you're interested in looking at them as I talk. Um, and I'll pass this one around the other direction. This is the first edition that came out. Um, I publish an interarts anthology series on campus that I started with the um, Porter College uh, George Hitchcock Poetry Fund uh, several years ago. The creative writing department asked, uh, department asked me to resurrect uh, Quarry West, which was a very famous literary magazine. And that's not really my thing, to resurrect anything that w is dead, and that's what George Hitchcock said too. So bring something else to, to, into being. And I'm, uh, my work over time has been working as a performance artist between genres for the most part, music, poetry, and performance. And um, so I wanted to create a book that had the effect of being an event, borrowing the um, Situationist um, Internacional um, idea of, of event, which is um, trying to set into motion unpredictable changes, not necessarily like the force majeure, <laughs> but, um, um, but be, being able to respond not from a top-down way like, say, labor unions often do, and I happen to be a member of a labor union, and the president of the local lecturers union, as a matter of fact, but I try to bring to the historical kind of hierarchical orientation of labor activism this spirit of responding to the situation at hand. Sort of like the students who showed up at the World Trade Organization in the 90s didn't know what to expect, and they just responded like Occupy Wall Street, you respond to the situation at hand. It involves a little bit of improvisation and, um, and also planning, all right? So um, this is a book called Event, and it has a little um, package of goodies in the back, which are a bunch of um, broadsides that interweave art and poetry. Um, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, you may know him as a poet. George Hitchcock is a painter and a poet. Jerome Rothenberg, who's a very famous poet who, inter, um, who intervened on a poem, I mean on a painting here, and of course Kenneth Patchen, who did his own um, poem pictures. So that book won an independent publishing award in 2007. And then it's taken me six years to put together the next book, which is ridiculous, I realize. But the infrastructure that is necessary to develop to put together a book of this size with 200 people in it is massive. And lacking at University of California, Santa Cruz, where we don't really have one place where um, a literary magazine comes out of. When I was an MFA student at Cornell, we just got $10,000 a year put out our magazine every year, but I have to sort of fundraise little bits and pieces um, to put, pull this one together. And I, am, and I, and I collaborated um, with members of the art department and other folks um, who put together this huge conference called Intervene, Interrupt, um, Rethinking Art in the social, uh, as Social Practice in 2008. So D. Hibbert Jones, Elizabeth Stevens, E.G. Crichton, and others who are professors in the art department, and um, Newton Harrison and his wife Helen Mayer Harrison were a huge part of that conference. They were the keynote speakers there as well. And so that was the genesis of this book, um, was, which is interventionist art. So I'm glad that Tim Fitzmorris brought up interventions because the book is entitled Viz Inter Arts Interventions. So the editorial philosophy is always inter arts, mixing arts up. I'm happy to talk about why I do that, but I do feel like in my writing pedagogy and my art practice itself, I feel that the arts inform each other in a way that enables each one of them to become stronger. So I try to teach my students how to write painterly essays or, you know, let's, let's, let's bring music into this lyric essay and so forth. I think it's really important to speak across genres. So I'm just going to read a teeny bit from the introduction. Um, Viz Inter Arts is a transgenre anthology series that enacts genre interventions and salutes recombinant forms. 
By breaking down barriers between textual, visual, performative, and scholarly modes, we encourage conversation between communities and genre specialists who too often only hear their news from tribal echo chambers. Through the juxtaposition of multiple galleries and sites in the book, I try to orient them so that it really does feel like you're walking through galleries. That's one of my curatorial hopes. Um, uh, <clears throat> the reader can enter an acre-sized ant farm inflatable, then turn a cor corner into the quiet of a poem or painting before walking outside with C.A. Conrad to lie on a blanket by Walmart, listening through headphones to the songs of extinct birds. How do the sights and sounds of this viz coalesce, and why should pathways like these inter intersect? Because we need to stage some art interventions. Interventions not only on economic practices that destroy ecological habitats and promote social inequality, but interventions on the ways that books, conferences, exhibits, and events tend to organize around genre purity or career silos to the exclusion of more interesting explorations. Perhaps many of us are bound up in, its, um, in ironic affiliations between institutions and more anarchic impulses. And so what I find is that being a member of basically the Bay Area, Bay Area experimental poetry community, I lived in San Francisco for five years and Oakland for three, and um, <clears throat> while I was teaching here and commuting back and forth, is that they were pretty much publishing books and holding events of each other. And it was very much a social sort of um, community that was, you know, through, through elaborate gift economies, um, readings, coffee houses, um, huge events, small events, promoting each other's work as poets in the world because this country doesn't really care that much about poets. Uh, other countries actually um, like poets as their diplomats and ambassadors, say South America, but not necessarily North America. So we're promoting each other, but at the same time becoming strangely provincial and insular. So this book is kind of performing an intervention on the idea that, that um, we, are, we are just speaking to ourselves. And trying, so I tried to bring in people who are staging interventions um, in different art forms who may have never heard of these poets and the poets who may have never heard of these folks. There are some famous people in the book like Reverend Billy and the Yes Men and Linda Montano and Guillermo Gomez Pena and Newton and Helen Mayer Harrison. There are a lot of people at the beginnings of their careers too. Um, so Viz endeavors to mix it up with new minds and modes for bigger causes, intervening on mon monocultures and monopolies across multiple related environments, from the natural to the social to the aesthetic. In particular, the slash that connects or destroys each side of the ecology-economy divide necessitates new practices and purposes for art, as well as intersectional logics that wake us up to the ways our separate ecologies all interconnect. It demands that we blur oppositional lines between art and life, artist and audience, public and private, private, and more. In that spirit, this, um, this edition, Viz Interarts Interventions, dilates the view to include art as social practice, hastening the artist's crucial response to social and environmental crises. And this is not new. I'm sure that some of you who have studied um, Dada, um, Futurism, Surrealism, know that those really innovative avant-garde, which means French for working on the front line, art movements, were born in response to large crises, military crises, World War I, right? So art's response to social crises is, is an important one. Um, so <clears throat> there are many ways to stage art interventions. Nato Thompson, co-author of the groundbreaking book, The Interventionists, gave a talk at the, at the UC Santa Cruz uh, conference, um, Intervene, Interrupt. Um, and the many events and talks of that e event are archived in about 100 pages of this book. Um, Thompson embraced the concept of tactical over interventionist art practices, even though the book he co-authored with Gregory Cholette has encouraged many artists to adopt that term. In his essay, Trespassing Toward Relevance, he disting distinguishes between Michel de Certeau's notion of strategies plans made by those who have the power to predict and change the lived landscape and tactics, which tend to be enacted as isolated blows against the empire. Interventionists, he says, could have the wonderful opportunity to have as their tagline, the art of the weak, as their projects in fact come from a trespassing into the territory of a dominant system. 
In the context of the rapacious spread of globalism after communism's trouncing in 1989, these trespassers have um, had to occupy and manipulate the language of commercialism in ever more sophisticated ways. In recent decades, those who would remove all restraint on capitalism, including the art cultures that protest its excesses, have ingeniously adopted the artist's subversive tactics to convey the coolness of their message. Think about Bob Dylan um, hawking Chryslers after the Super Bowl, for God's sakes. Um, think about Jack Kerouac being used by the Gap to sell their khakis. Think about the uh, self-styled Che Guevara Taco Bell Chihuahua in a beret. Um, so we need to become more sophisticated because we're inundated by commercials, thousands of them every week, if we're, if we're letting ourselves be. So we respond in kind. In different ways, we're all complicit with the power structures we may find abhorrent in the abstract. Subversive complicity, one section of the UC Santa Cruz Conference on Interventionist Art used tactical events to capture this paradox complicitly. So um, part of the, the conference uh, involved uh, humor, right? Um, and, um, and, and, and paradox, right? So whether they would uh, self-identify as interventionist, tactical art, artists, or something else altogether, the trespassers in Viz keep trying out clearer ways to deal these blows. Drawing from the deck of Ant Farm's tactics, some, including the Yes Men and Reverend Billy, so let's see, let's go to page six if we can in Viz final. Um, use mass media as a tool to undermine the influence of mass media and its fame-making machinery, even as they become somewhat famous trying. Okay, so Reverend Billy, how many of you have heard of him? Um, he's a monologuist who came of age basically in the 90s um, as a, um, someone who used to produce Spalding Gray and other mon monologuists, and his friend Sydney, Sydney Lanier said, why don't you try out being a, a, a preacher like Jimmy Swaggart? He reaches a lot of people, parody him. Um, start a new religion, make it anti-commercial, make it anti-capitalist. He scoffed at first, but then he tried it out. And I'm just going to read from a piece that um, he, he, it's a talk that he gave here at UCSC a couple of years ago. Um, Amen, earth hallelujah. I'd like to talk about the arts today. What role do performers, storytellers, comedians, and yes, preacher types play in this time of the apocalypse? Visiting in the Bay Area from New York, I'm here in the community where the Church of Stop Shopping began its first forays into the secular and political take on preaching. After we moved to New York in the 90s, um, Reverend S Sidney Lanier, then in his 60s, and me in my 40s, we moved to the Apple, and he put me in front of the Disney store in Times Square. This decision surprised me at first, this brutal place with its white noise and giant supermodels and the 10-foot tall Mickey Mouse that looked down on me from the storefronts, the most famous logo in the world. Um, so basically, he started there just preaching in, in, in Times Square, and um, he, st he moved to uh, Starbucks. In fact, Starbucks manuals f for their workers now have a section that says what to do if Reverend Billy shows up to try to exercise the cash register. Um, so he talks about art. He says, the fact that the word arts isn't very useful. When you pick up the art section of the New York Times, it's just full of artists. But what are they really accomplishing? What's really happening there? There seems to be no connection there to the supreme question of our life, time, physical life. Will it continue? We're losing hundreds of, of species every day. We're in the midst of a mass extinction. It's a self-conscious induced extinction by an apex predator. So he talks about ways in which if you find out something from the New York Times about climate change, it will be lost in the last page of, the, you know, of, of some obscure section. And so he's taking um, art activism out to the streets, appealing to people who now um, need more sophisticated forms of media to grab their attention. As you all know, people holding signs and screaming aren't going to do it anymore, right? And the person that I'm kind of sitting in for today, David Solnit, helped us on this campus um, as lecturers doing labor activism to design huge puppets and then we have to sing and dance and perform to get people's attention. You have to do a lot of work these days just because there's a lot of sophisticated um, media out there. Um, so the Yes Men, page <clears throat> 111, are another group that were part of this conference and um, you may have heard of them before. Um, Andy Bicklebaum and Je Mike Bonanno um, call themselves the Yes Men. 
because yes, men, yes, their way into power, right? They're basically um, older rich white men in suits or whatever. So they, so they will dress up as kind of um, older rich white men in suits and just show up places and they're taken seriously because they just appear like, you know, normal. And um, they'll get invited to places. They'll make up names and get invited to places. They were invited to um, a conference um, about um, uh, what to do about the Bhopal disaster, the, oil, the chemical spill. And they made an announcement, a false announcement, that, Bhopal, that the Dow Chemical Company was going to clean up the mess. Immediately, Dow Chemical's uh, stocks plunged and they lost $4 billion in one shot. They found out it was a hoax and it went back up. And so that showed them, right, that the market forces, the free market forces, will respond to mass media tactics, right, which is what the ant, what ant farm taught people. And that's why they are, um, central to this book. They're the sort of forefathers, in some ways, of the more current art interventionists, right? Because they would do things like um, set up a bunch of televisions and drive their cars through them and get on NBC News at night using mass media as a tactic to protest mass media, right? So um, page 165, is the whole uh, section on inflatables, Ant Farm is a huge part of the book, giving you the history of a group of folks, um, Chip Lord being one of them, he's a professor here of film and digital media, and he helps start Ant Farm. And um, they wanted to um, create these inflatable structures that were um, portable and um, affordable, and drawing on Buckminster Port, uh, Fuller's idea of the geodesic dome, which is really lightweight and um, based on the concept of tensegrity. You could just airdrop lightweight, cheap homes all over the world. Um, in this case, you would just blow them up and you would take them to um, events and concerts and so forth and that sort of thing. Um, page 68 um, is a, a page on live film narration, Neo Benchy, that's part of the book. Um, the Benchy was the silent film narrator during um, Japan and Korea who would stand to the side of the screen and narrate the action of the film because they were silent. And um, in San Francisco, we started a movement called Neo Benchy when I was living there in 2003, and we re-narrate an alternative um, uh, version of the film, and um, it takes a lot of work. I've done Streetcar Named Desire, Rebel Without a Cause, and a few others, and it's really caught on fire and kind of become this um, nationwide form, but it's definitely in the spirit of Viz, and it's talking back to Hollywood, which often talks at us and makes our, um, you know, gives us the thoughts that we have. Um, page 46, in the spirit of um, ge the geodesic domes by Buckminster Fuller, which I just referenced, um, we have some folks who um, make dress tents. Um, it's sort of playing on this kind of sexy notion of the underside of a woman's skirt as a social space and entering these large site-specific installations. Um, Robin Lasser and uh, Adrian Powell do these amazing dress tents. So this one is the Mumu dress tent, kind of playing off the colonizing strategies in Hawaii of introducing the, the missionary, you know, the missionaries int inter, uh, in introducing um, certain rites. Um, and this is called the missionary Mumu dress. <clears throat> and there are other projects that they have done that are like that. This is the greenhouse dress. Um, Page 173, the Orphan Sign Project um, repurposes old signs in, um, along Highway 66 in New Mexico, ones that have been abandoned by hotels, uh, at hotels and so forth, and just putting poetry up there. So New Mexico uh, University professor named Ellen Babcock got her students to, to do that. Page 184. Uh, curatorial interventions is one of the bigger sections of the book, and it tries to think about curatorial practice um, in terms of interventions. So how can Carnival be um, a, a curation? How can uh, repurposing billboards in LA be curation? Um, how do we intervene on static forms in the white cube and make it more performative? Um, there's a lot on eco-art and eco-poetics. Um, and um, so I'm not going to go over all of that right now, but I just would like to just look at page 88 
and um, mention a little bit about the conference that this whole book comes from. Um, I have another minute or so. And um, subversive complicity is one of the sections. Uh, the concept um, was, you know, art that's engaged in the social sphere is, is frequently described as interventions, dialogic practice, place-based situations, relational aesthetics, public performances, or social practice. And so um, there are a lot of different ways to intervene and interrupt, and they did that in this conference that lasted for several days. It was one of the most amazing events I've ever been to on this campus in 2008. Um, and that was one section of it. Page 98, one of the more amazing interventions that took place was at Wells Fargo Bank. Um, so page 99, I'll just read about it. Um, the Center for Tactical Magic began with a plan to hold up a bank, Wells Fargo. Why Wells Fargo? Wells Fargo is one of the largest investors in GEO Group, a major contractor for private prisons, immigration and customs enforcement, and the military-run detention camps at Guantanamo Bay. By mobilizing at least 100 Wells Fargo customers to stand in an eternally revolving line at the bank for one business day, concerned citizens managed to hold up the bank and restrict the usual flow of business without breaking any laws. Um, so the police were called in, um, but they said, well, they're not really breaking any laws. And so they, were, they, they intervened and they were able to break up business. And Wells Fargo said that um, you have no idea how much damage they're actually causing. So it was effective. Um, Reverend Billy does that constantly. He brings in his church to stop shopping into banks, especially J.P. Morgan Chase, who is underwriting, and Bank of America is underwriting a lot of mountaintop removal to very efficiently get all the coal needed in West Virginia and um, Kentucky. And um, he'll, he'll go in there and make, you know, sing songs about it <laughs> or dress up as golden toads because the golden toad is becoming extinct. So some, some things are silly, but they get, they get people's attention. Um, to wrap up page 128, another section of the conference um, was d devoted to the intersection between art and life. And so Professor Elizabeth Stevens and her wife, Annie Sprinkle, who got married habitually once a year for seven years to imitate the famous um, endurance artist Linda Montano's seven-year art projects. And so they each year would be a different color matching the chakras. So there was the red wedding, the orange wedding. Chakras are energy centers, uh, according to Ayurvedic medicine in your body. Um, you know, the red, uh, and so basically it was about endurance. Um, Linda Montano would really endure. She would, for example, when it was the orange year, wear orange every day, sit in an orange um, room, a cube, for seven hours, listen to one tone, like B-flat, for seven hours, and speak in one accent, like Hillary Clinton or French, for a whole year. And she was trying to imitate the endurance models of like nuns, Tibetan nuns and others, and now she's a Catholic nun herself, um, in order to um, endure things that are coming at us. You can use art to practice that and get ready for it. Um, this is a little bit funner, though. Um, next page, 129. Um, this blurring of art in life is really famous, and the, and the artist Robert Rauschenberg famously described himself as working in the gap between art and life. And Alan Capro, who self-styled the happenings of the 60s, talked more about it, blurring of art and life. So this whole section, next page, 130, is really... Um, Important. So they had a green wedding in the forest, Annie and um, Beth, um, to correspond to the fourth chakra. Newton and Helen um, gave a, a homily. Lots of people are there. Lots of famous people show up at their weddings. And this one, because it was green, enabled them to think about starting their movement, which is eco-sexuality, how to make eco um, work more sexy, basically. Um, and so... I have so much more to say, but I, that's it. I had 15 minutes, and so what I'm going to do is stop and um, just take, you know, if you have any questions about the, the project or about anything in it, um, feel free to ask a little bit right now, but there will be a panel discussion. Thank you so much, Roxy.